Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks very much for um, inviting me to give this talk. Um, it's always a, a really bad mistake to try and cram too much stuff into a talk. Um, but I thought for a workshop, it may be worthwhile to throw out a few different ideas, given that where people are working in different fields, and just throw out some ideas and see if connections can be made outside of the seminar room. So I'll maybe make a, an attempt to talk about kind of throw three things, three things out there, but I'm not too bothered if we don't really get there. And I'll try and take my time and um, see where things go. So I'd like to talk about an alternative AMPS experiment, um, which evades this Harlow um, Hayden obstacle. Um, um, and also, I think, has some implications for the black hole as mirrors experiment as well. Um, and then, um, depending on how much time I have, what I'd like to talk about is attempts to generalize quantum theory or attempts to modify quantum theory in light of AMPS and in light of the black hole information problem, um, either by modifying the state space so that information flows very differently. So I'll talk about generalizations of quantum theory where um, information can do really strange things. For example, small systems can purify very high dimensional um, objects. We can do things um, in these generalized theories um, which you could only do if you violated an entropy bound. Um, and you can do something called um, information hiding, which is something that you can't do in um, quantum mechanics. Um, and then if I have time, and I don't think I will, I'll talk about fundamental, fundamental destruction of information, um, which still respects conservation laws. Um, and that's, I suppose, where my uh, prejudice lies. Um, and maybe that's something, uh, information loss seems to be something which, as a, as, not, as a solution to the black hole information problem, seems to be something which is getting, which is a more conservative idea and seems to be getting more conservative every day. Um, and I'll just mention that, um, I guess, because this is an interdisciplinary conference that, or workshop that um, if, there's, if people know any postdocs that are kind of in the, in the interface of, of quantum information and other fields, particularly quantum gravity, that we are hiring postdocs there. Okay, so um, I think um, Scott gave a very good, um, very good description of the Harlow-Hayden obstacle, um, which is just to uh, throw it up there again, is just the fact that if I have a black hole here, BH, which is, um, has evaporated past its page time. So um, it's, it's now maximally tangled with its Hawking radiation. Um, then, and so we represent that by the state BH. And zero is just some extra degrees of freedom. Um, and it has some unitary acting on it, um, which is the unitary of quantum gravity um, and the evaporation process then in order to decode these mineable modes between the zone and the early time Hawking radiation, we need to apply U dagger to the um, Hawking radiation. And that will allow us to decode, um, decode pure state entanglement between the zone and the early time Hawking radiation. And the problem is that that takes too long um, because of complexity arguments. And by the time we're able to act at unitary, the black hole has evaporated. So what I want to give is an alternative experiment um, where you can set up the black hole so that um, rather than radiating in a kind of a horrible scrambled mess, it radiates EPR pairs um, like ducks in a row. So I imagine that I have um, you know, each EPR, each, each photon that comes out of the black hole that radiates away is nicely entangled with a piece of quantum memory with half of its, its, its EPR partner, one after the other. Okay. So let me um, describe that experiment in steps. Um, I'm going to imagine for the moment that I have an entangled black hole. Um, so a black hole which is maximally entangled with some quantum memory. All right. So I'm going to imagine that I have some registers, MB and MH, two quantum registers, quantum memory. And now, um, so this is, and I have a black hole which is maximally entangled with it. So I'm going to imagine that BH is inside the black hole. And I'm just going to use the system E, the environment, just to denote um, potential other degrees of freedom, right? environmental degrees of freedom. 
So I have a maximally entangled black hole between some quantum memory. Um, and I'm going to use B and H as before, where B is going to be the zone degrees of freedom. And um, H is what's going to remain inside the black hole. Right? But for the moment, initially, BH is inside the black hole. Um, and now I'm going to let it evaporate a bit. So let me just donate W, um, first of all, just which is acting on the black hole. That's just going to, I'll, I'm just sticking that in there because I might imagine um, that, the, that all these degrees of freedom, you know, what is going to be a zone mode and what is going to be a horizon, sorry, a zone photon and a horizon photon. Um, you know, that may be very scrambled inside the black hole. So I'm going to just um, imagine some unitaries applied to the stuff that's in the black hole. Um, and now I let it evaporate a bit. So I'm going to denote evaporation by some unitary, which acts on the black hole. So it acts on the inside of the black hole and the environmental degrees of freedom, To, And then I'm going to imagine that the system B is now accessible to the outside observer. And E is as well, but we're not going to worry too much about E. We're not going to, we're not going to use it, right? Because there may be some additional, we imagine there may be some additional Hawking evaporation. Okay, is that clear so far, this kind of scenario? People should feel free to interrupt with. B is going to be the zone, is the system that's in the zone. Well, just that it's now in the, it's now in the zone, I guess. So initially, it's in the zone. So initially, I'm imagining that I've got uh, a maximally entangled black hole. So it's as if it's hit its page time, and now I evaporate. I let it evolve a bit. So now it's, you know, and you can think of it as being past its page time. So it, you started with this maximally entangled state, but it's it's not a generic maximally entangled state. It's a clever one, right? Where you have the MB register entangled with what will be the zone modes and the MH register. Entangled with what will be the rest of the whole. Is that the idea? The, Not the notation necessarily. Sense? No. Um, so the memory is clever, or I mean, <laughs> the the memory is just nice EP, half of EPR pairs, one after the other. But I've put this. The reason the reason I put this W here is because I didn't want you to think that I was cheating somehow and I and, and kind of being too clever about how I created this black hole. So. Um, I, you know, this WBH is kind of scrambling up all these degrees of freedom. Right, right, but but once this evaporation happens, you're saying that the entanglement is between your MB register and the zone, and then separately between your MH register and the black that, hole? Uh, I, well, I'll say that, that you can decode it. I mean, I'll get there, but what I'll be saying is that you can you can, you can now act on the, the memory to, to make that happen. Yeah, but no, but it's not, I, I'm not, I'm not imagining that I'm so clever that I could just have EPR pairs pop up in such a way that I'll, well, I, I, w I will say that later, actually, but um, for the moment, I'm just assuming that this is a big mess and scrambles things completely and pops out. And when it pops out, it's not the case that these EPR pairs are nice, the zone, the zone photons are nicely entangled with this memory MB, but I'm going to argue in a bit that we can make that happen. All right, and now it's it's become a, um, a fairly standard um, idea from information theory taken into um, people that study black holes that if I look at the state of the what's the stuff that's inside the black hole, and I'm going to actually include the this E system as well, just because I may use it later. Um, e is just stuff that get lost and I don't have access to. Um, I'm going to, it's now, it's by well, kind of, a, it's a standard assumption that this unitary is sufficiently scrambling, is a scrambling unitary, so that the um, state of what's inside the black hole is decoupled from the, what's sometimes called the reference system or the memory register. So I, I've imagined effectively that, you know, this memory register is very tiny, could even just be one EPR pair. This MB could just be one EPR pair. And so if sufficiently, if it's a sufficient number of um, photons escape the black hole, say three, then the inside of the black hole, uh oh, I've said something. Um, if the inside of, if, if say a few photons escape the black hole, you know, 
you know, just more than the size of this register, then I will have the black hole will be decoupled from this very small quantum memory. All right? This is just a, st a kind of a standard decoupling assumption, and it's what is behind the black hole as mir you know the mirror effect of um, Patrick and John. So uh, let me say it again. You know, this memory register is very tiny, maybe just a, a qubit or two. And um, if the unitary, if the dynamics, we're assuming unitary, if the dynamics of the black hole is sufficiently scrambling, then the black hole will become decoupled from the memory, right, or the reference system. And now, I think this is kind of the, one of the nicest things about quantum information theory. Um, if the black hole is decoupled from the memory, it must be that the entanglement has left the black hole. Right? And now we can. It's the Hayden Prescott argument. Right? It must be that, the, um, that this EPR pair has left the black hole. So, for example, I, ha I now have this product state between the inside of the black hole and the quantum memory, the small register. Um, one purification of this product state is. And I can, I can only purify it on the remaining uh, universe, which is, in this case, just the memory register, MH, and um, B, the zone photons. So one purification is this state here, where I have pure EPR pairs between the B register of my memory, the MB register, and um, pure state entanglement with the inside of the black hole. All right? And the key thing now is that purifications are unique up to a unitary on the purifying system. So if the state of my system is not of this form, then I can apply VBM. So I can apply a unitary on the purifying system, because purifications are unique up to a unitary on the purifying system. I can apply this decoding unitary on the zone photons and MH, and I can create this product state. I, this, I can de I de can decode these EPR pairs with the quantum memory. Right? This is just the um, hayden Presco mirror. Right? So just a few photons leave the black hole, and instantly I'm able to decode EPR pairs. I shouldn't say instantly able to decode, but I can, in principle, um, immediately decode EPR pairs with this small quantum memory MP. Right? Now, once again, this will also take too long. This decoding unitary will probably also take too long. Um, so, you know, this problem uh, that decoding takes a long time is also a problem that affects the hayden Prescott mirror. Um, but I can, in principle, do it if I have long enough time. Okay. And now, I guess the key point is that in addition to the interior of the black hole being decoupled from MB, the small little memory register, it's also decoupled from the zone, the photons in the zone. Okay, this, I think, is something that Raphael also noted in his talk. Um, you know, effectively, if you're in an ordinary black hole, if you're past the page time, then once you're past the page time, additional photons, when they emerge from the black hole, um, they're, they're reducing the mutual information with the early time Hawking radiation, and they're completely decoupled from the inside of the black hole. All right? So we now have that the inside of the black hole is decoupled from the zone photons. And now, once again, we play the same trick. We can, one purification is a purification where we've purified the zone photons on the quantum memory, and we purify the interior of the black hole on the quantum memory. This purification is unique up to a unitary on the quantum memory. All right. So we can apply, if, if our state is not of this form, we can apply this decoding map on the quantum memory to get and decode photons uh, which are maximally entangled between the zone and the quantum memory. Are there any questions at this point? So I guess the,
question that I asked Raphael. I, I'm, I'm somehow missing the argument for why this tensor product right. structure right. Is, is expected. Because these are systems that are closely interacting. interacting. And so how, wh what really is the argument for why you can write down this, this approximate tensor product? Because the state is very mixed. So for example, just to give w one example which is close to this, although not exactly this, if I have a maximally mixed state, even the, and now I apply an arbitrary unitary to that and take, you know, and separate it into two parts, that'll be in a product state. And it's in a product state just because it's maximally mixed. In other words, it doesn't matter how interacting the unitary is. In fact, we want it to be very, very highly interacting because we want it to be scrambling. This thing will be in a product state because it's a very mixed state. But this is part of the discussion uh, that's still going on. Uh, because, uh, for example, in, in, in Daniel's talk, his delta n is precisely the thing that would still uh, uh, account for some entanglement between H and B. Well, there he had a, a pure state with two systems and found it very unlikely that you get a product state. So it's true that if you have a pure state, it's very unlikely that you will have a But as soon as you have entanglement between B and H, that would uh, subtract from, from this being a ten tensor product. Right. I mean, the, the, the point is that you have a huge amount of entanglement between these two systems here and this quantum memory. So because you have something that is very highly entangled already, it, it, it's a, in some sense a property of a monogamy of entanglement. If I have two, if I have a system which is, if I have say two systems which are highly entangled with a quantum memory or another system, then they can't be classically correlated with each other. I understand the argument, yes. But uh, right. yeah, the question is if, if this is apply, apl applicable to this particular situation. But I understand the argument, okay. Right. I mean, you can think of it, another way of just thinking about it is that when you're past the page time, you're now reducing, um, you know, the stuff that's coming out is now maximally entangled with the quantum memory. Okay, you can just do a simple, um, I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't put the calculation in here because it, it, it didn't seem to me that it added much, but it, you can show that, you know, it has very small mutual information. If it has very small information, it's very pure, and you can show that, therefore, it must be close to a state which is product. So the key point now is that this unitary, which again is going to take a long time, but the key point is that this unitary is acting only on the quantum memory. Right? It's not acting on the radiating photons. And that's, the, that's important. Because now I can do it before I've even created the black hole. Right? So I can, in some sense, I can this unitary, this decoupling, this decoding unitary, which is acting on the memory, I can do it, you know, I have as much time as I want. I do it before, I do it on the share of the quantum memory, and I do it before I create the black hole out of the second share. So let me kind of go through that in steps. So I start off with a maximally entangled state between a quantum memory we'll call M, and we'll mark them by systems B and systems H, and BMH and a quantum memory n, okay? So just a maximally entangled state of high dimension. I'm now gonna act this decoding map on the m registers, okay? I haven't, there's no black hole here, and I have as long as I want, okay? So even though it's gonna be take exponentially long probably to decode, to act this decoding unitary, I have as long as I, I want because there's no black hole at this point. And now what I do is I take this other quantum register and I transfer it onto some heavy stuff. And I form a black hole with this heavy stuff. And we'll use W to be this um, process which forms a black hole. And now I have, a, again, a maximally entangled black hole. So a black hole which is maximally entangled with a quantum register. But unlike the um, initial, you know, when, when Don was asking his question, where it was kind of in a, you know, you didn't have your B register entangled with the zone, because I've acted this map, the B register will now be entangled with the photons which emerge from the zone, okay, or which go into the zone. So you, you effectively create a black hole which just spits out EPR pairs completely paired with its neighbor. Oh, 
Got one. <laughs> Three. Uh, does it matter that, I guess, the number of states that you can create with the heavy stuff is much less than the number of states given by the Bekenstein Hawking entropy? Well, you need to, so, uh, so and, and then how you get the number of states right. that corresponds so that, to the Bekenstein Hawking entropy is you have to either start twice as big and let it evaporate or feed it for a long time. Is, yeah, is that relevant for this? Yeah, I think that is a, a relevant and, and a difficult thing to do. So I'll get to that in the next slide. And Well, or, or does that stand in the way of your uh, using well, this I'm method? Well, I'm sure there are some, I, I'm sure it may be that some you may like it prefer an, an alternative title to my talk, which would be, it's impossible to create maximally entangled black holes. Um, but I don't, see a, I don't see a physical reason why you shouldn't be able to do that. And let me get to the next slide maybe, and we can discuss at that point, because I do expect some, I do expect that to be. OK, so, so as, as, you, as you say, it's a bit difficult to form a black so what I what I want to really do is I want to form a black hole which is at its tipping point in the sense that I want that the Bekenstein entropy is the same as its entanglement entropy. All right? And that is is not such an easy thing to do. But the key point is if you go back a bit, if you go back a bit, um, the key point is that all I required was that the photons in the zone are decoupled not just from you know, there's, I don't need to make a distinction between what's inside the black hole and what is in our, what are environmental degrees of freedom, which I don't have access to. So if in, in this process of trying to create the black hole, a bunch of, um, of photons escape in the process because I'm sloppy, it's not a big deal because there's no distinction really between what's inside the black hole and environmental degrees of freedom. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to touch either of them anyway, so I don't need to worry about them. So all I really need is that the dynamics of going from this stuff into a black hole, I don't mind. So this would be a perfect creation. I don't mind if some stuff escapes into the environment. Um, all I really need is that this, the, the dynamics that creates this black hole are A, sufficiently scrambling, and B, at some point, at some point, create a black hole which is at its tipping point in the sense that um, it's now going to start emitting photons, which are, um, um, and it's now going to start emitting photons, which are entangled with the memory. So a bunch of the stuff that comes off will be, well, entangled with the internal state of the black hole, so it will now be part of the uh, reference system, I guess, or you're calling the quantum memory. Is that well, if the dynamics are, you know, if the dynamics are sufficiently scrambling, then that that, that is pretty unlikely to happen. No, I think that's what Hawking radiation does. Yeah, but don't forget you're creating something which has very high entanglement entropy with something else as well. Or let me say it another way. Maybe I can say it another way. If I have, if I succeed in creating a black hole which is evaporated a lot because a lot of it escapes, right? Then or another way of saying it is that at the, you know, at the, after the page time, we start to have a firewall problem because we have this problem that the photons are entangled with the interior and also with the early time Hawking radiation. So we have this problem at the page time. But we have this problem throughout the evaporation process. So each photon that escapes needs to be maximally entangled with the early time Hawking radiation as well. So in other words, you know, if, for example, I think, so imagine the following, that I create a, a, an entangled black hole which is which is at this tipping point, and then let it evaporate for a huge amount of time, then even those late time, you know, the very final set of photons, they're also going to have the same problem that they're going to have this violation of monogamy. So it's not just the first few photons after the page time which have a monogamy problem. It's, it's all the photons which come out of the black hole which have a monogamy problem. So in some sense, if I create a black hole which is, which, and in the process, uh, some photons escape, then, then that's okay. I have, I guess, a, a related question. If, as you're creating the black hole, somebody else, let's say, throws in a particle in a state that you don't have control over, but just one, right. my impression is that the pre-computation will no longer be useful. Is that correct? Um, no. If, it depends how many photons you throw in. 
let's say it's like five. I mean, some order one. That should still be okay because I could just imagine that that's equivalent to my. Um, so let's go back here. Are we do, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that that no, no. That may be a problem. Indeed, that may be a problem. With yeah. even an order one, order one. Um, Um, I would doubt that. I guess that's a question of how scrambling this this thing is. I mean, I I, I I would suspect not. So I think but in, if you throw in a large enough half of an entangled state, then you certainly could in some sense, screw up the decoding map. Because I guess what it's equivalent to doing is saying that you don't have full control over this memory. You know, it's, it's like saying that you don't, it's like saying that you don't have access. You're not, I'm not, you're not allowing me to play this decoding map. Yeah, you're granting yourself complete quantum control over all aspects of the collapse process, right? Is that a not fair, so is that a fair uh, description? Um, yeah, I think that's true. Okay. And I think this is, I'm just using the same assumptions that you made in, you know, in, in your paper. That, that's true. No, I mean, we, right, 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 it's true. Right. But we were thinking about something different, so we, we, I mean, aspects of our discussion are certainly not realistic. Um, right, but I think in, in your, you know, in, in, in your paper, your, one of your key assumptions was that in principle you could apply this decoding map, u dagger. Well, so I'm yeah, granting we only allowed to apply I, it to the radiation. I mean, here you're, you're, you're. I mean, when you make this black hole, if you want to control it, you have to make it slowly, and then. Uh, so then now you want to be able to act with the unitary directly on the black hole. No, no, no. I don't. I'm never acting on the black hole. I mean, I'm not acting. No, with I don't mean the, the pre-computation. I mean right. the collapse process. Right. Um, yeah, I'm assuming that you know the unitary. You, you at least know the unitary that you that you did. Which yeah. I think is similar to you need to know that as well, right? Because you are applying and the initial state, I guess, right? Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just I'm just using the same assumptions that I know perfectly this unitary and that there's not some malicious person, or if there is some malicious person, I at least know what they're. Okay. So one, um, there's a few ways I guess you could do this. I think that the way I like the most, which was suggested actually by Bill Andrew, was that you. Um, Use this um, the the inverse of or the reverse operation of mine of this black hole mining. So I copy the stuff into a box of radiation. I slowly lower it to some seed black hole. Slowly lower it, then I open up the um, trap door, let the um, radiation fall into the black hole, and slowly build up the black hole that way. Um, and in that way, I'm effectively you know I'm the all the energy is getting redshifted, so I'm slowly building up this black hole in such a way that I get the most entropy for the energy I'm dumping into the black hole. Okay. Um, maybe just as an aside, you can now ask what if, so now that we have this nice black hole which is emitting EPR pairs, if you now ask what should Alice measure in order to verify this polyamory of entanglement, um, I think what I would like her to do is superluminary signal. Okay, that's, um, um, and the reason I want her to do that is because I'm actually a bit interested in generalizations of quantum theory where you may get states, or they're not really states, they're things that look like quantum states, but which, you know, you can get things which might look like quantum states on any two systems, but only when you have all three together. Uh, you, you might want to ask, how would I verify that this is not one of those objects? And if you want a, a kind of a theory-independent way to verify that you have um, polyamorous entanglement, then one way to do that is to do a bell, uh, a bell test on these three systems. And if you do this bell test, you can, in fact, succeed in superluminally signaling. So I can imagine, for example, uh, is this well known, maybe? Okay, so you know, if I have a system B which is maximally entangled with my quantum memory and maximally entangled with its, uh, its um, partner which fell into the black hole, then Alice who's able to grab these things, maybe I would want two Alices, one is going to grab the zone photon 
and, um, and the other Alice is going to grab the quantum memory that's entangled with the zone photon and the, the pair um, of the zone photon. And now Alice is going to measure in either the Z basis or the X basis, and Alice's friend is going to measure in kind of these um, um, EPR, sorry, these, these bell type bases where I kind of measure at an angle um, in between X and Z. And that's just like a CHSH test. But if this really is polyamorous entanglement, then I will violate a bell inequality between B and B bar, and I'll also violate a bell inequality between B and MB. And it's fairly easy to see that that will allow superluminal signaling in a region which, by the equivalence principle, should be fairly flat and unremarkable. All right, so um, you can just see that if Alice, met, you know, the basis that this person chooses, that Al Alice chooses the basis either Z or X, and by measuring on these two other um, uh, qubits or photons, you can tell which basis Alice measured in. So Alice can superluminally signal using this polyamorous entanglement. And I think that's a nice theory independent way to kind of verify that something really crazy is going on. Any questions? Um, so this also, I think, is relevant for the hayden Preskill mirror. I think um, it's kind of like a funhouse mirror, right? Because when the information, when the, that kind of, you know, you throw in half of an EPR pair, it comes back really quickly, but it comes back in such a scrambled form that you can't really tell what it even is. You have to perform this huge decoding map before you can tell that you got a photon out. So it's a bit like a funhouse mirror where all the information is there, but it's in such a twisted form that it looks pretty funny. Um, but you can use, the, you know, it's exactly the same process, and so you can use this notion of making an entangled black hole to kind of create, I guess, a flat mirror where you throw in half of an EPR pair. It comes out right away, but it comes out perfectly paired with its... Uh, its friend that was that you that it was the reference system that it was initially entangled to. Right. So this is like a, a flat. I, I guess I'm calling it a flat mirror. Okay. Um, I guess that's the first part um, of this alternative AMPS experiment. I, and maybe I'll stop in case there's. Should, I don't know. I can keep going, but I could stop in case there's questions about that. And maybe I'm out of time anyway. But okay. Good. Okay. Are there any questions about the this alternative AMPS experiment? I mean, how good does this factorization between uh, rho B and rho H need to be? Sorry about that. <laughs> how, um, how, how good is this factorization uh, that rho is equal to rho B cross rho H need to be uh, in order for your for these these tricks to work? To work. Well, they're about. So the, it turns out the factorization is about the same as the factorization in the mirror. So if I have a fidelity of one minus epsilon, um, the fact if the factorization is one minus epsilon between the. I mean, I guess it's a. You know, the more product the state is, the better the fidelity of the EPR pair that I'm distilling. So um, that's due to something called Ullman's theorem. So if I have a certain trace norm in productness, then I it can map that very easily up to some kind of factor of two, I think, to the fidelity of this EPR pair that I've succeeded in decoding. Um, and the fidelity in this case is about the same as the fidelity of the mirror. So, um, you know, um, the, if the if the um, state is close to product um, between the um, in, inside of the black hole and the quantum memory, then it will also be close to product in roughly this one minus epsilon between the um, um, zone and the in, inside of the black hole. Okay, thanks. Okay. I have a question for Lenny. Um, wouldn't you say that it was your interpretation that that this experiment forms one of the very special states that has black hole that has a firewall? I mean, you, 
Lenny and Juan, but I mean, you you have this. I mean, you you would you have the idea that certain operations on an entangled system will produce a firewall, and is that is the idea that this is one of those very special things that would produce a firewall? Follow that up to clear. So, at least one other person doesn't understand the setup. So, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll try to at least clarify. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, why don't? Well, you can try. Happy or for I could, Daniel. I'm or happy I, for Daniel to take the coin cell and. Uh, or I could ask a certain way of looking at it, which may help or not. Uh, you know, if you want to form a black hole where you have all of the Bekenstein Hawking counting of states excited, or, or you can have all of those as part of an ensemble. Uh, sort of the simplest way, and maybe the only way I know to do it, is start with, say, collapsing matter where you don't have nearly enough states, and uh, start with a black hole that's, say, twice as large as the, one, the target one, and then let it evaporate down to uh, the target mass, and then you have built up via the Hawking radiation an entanglement between the black hole states and the outgoing Hawking radiation that is the right size. And so then the outgoing Hawking radiation is the reference system. And uh, I think, you know, if you do that, then you've got to act uh, on that reference system with your operator. But, of course, you've got a limited time you can do that as well. Uh, and so I guess, well, one question might be whether you get into these um, complexity limitations, et cetera. But uh, do you, well. No, I want to build up the black hole in this kind of method of using kind of Bill and Bob's waste disposal. Things are doing very gradually. Um, so that's different from what I just said. That I is guess. different, and I would worry about the way that you want to do it because it's exactly this problem that I've got. You know, I've got to let this thing evaporate for a while. I've, in some sense, introduced another reference system. Yeah, yeah. You automatic the Hawking radiation you know, produces a reference system for yeah. you, and exactly. Okay. So, so you really need a different method to. That's right. It. I just. The, the, you want to build up the black hole basically reversibly is the point, yeah. right? Okay. Isentropically. Yeah. Isentropically. Yeah. Okay. So that means does does that mean that the black hole has to be in some small, highly reflecting box in order to proceed? Yeah. I mean, I, when I'm building it up, I I think what I will want to do. I mean, I don't mind if a lot of stuff escapes, but I think what I want to do is I'm going to want to put a mirror. I'm going to I'm going to put this mirror there so that um, you know stuff that does escape. I mean, I don't mind if a lot of it escapes. Escapes the mirror or escapes the black hole? Or does it matter? It doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, that's basically the idea. Yeah. I don't mind if stuff gets lost, but I don't want to someone putting in any entanglement. I think you could one way you could do this is you could take ADS and then you could just throw in from the boundary one half of a you know, a, an EPR pair, just photons, just slowly throw them in and keep the other Keep the other uh, EPR partner out at the boundary, and it's ADS, so that you don't have to worry. They'll they'll make a black hole eventually, and you just slowly throw them in. And I think now there's entropy production in that, though, right? I mean, usually when you throw something into a black hole, the entropy increases by more, right? Are you going to balance the Hawking flux when you do that? That that's another way, by the way, which is closely, I think, closely related yeah. to what I said. I, I can try to answer Joe's question. So I, I think roughly you should just think of this as the situation where you have a black hole which is maximally entangled with something else. And I think you guys would just say that in some cases it's clear that there is uh, that the horizon is smooth, but it's not clear in general. So you, you, you don't, I mean, you'd have to, you know, understand something that we don't understand now. Well, I, I'm not so sure. I mean, in the sense that I don't think, you know, in some sense the fact that this thing is maximally entangled, or whether something's maximally entangled or in a pure state, it's hard for me to see how the black hole can know because, um, you know, I could imagine that I measured the memory, and if I measured the memory, then this is just some pure state forming a black hole. Yeah, so well, that's the audacity of the proposal, right? All right. Well, <laughs> all right, that's. <laughs> I mean, not 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 as a criticism, but I mean that's you know. 
Sure. But I mean, from, from a point of view of local physics, physics around, you know, if I ignore, if I move this memory far, as far away as possible, from that point of view, this black hole that, or this attempt to form the black hole cannot know whether I'm trying to form the black hole from a pure state or from some mixed state. Because just. No, no, no. Well, I know. I mean, I'm just saying from the point of view of local physics. From the point of view of local physics. There's a wormhole connecting them. So if you do something on one, then it goes through the wormhole. No, no, no. It doesn't get out on the other side. I'm just talking about this situation here where I have a memory, right? And I'm creating a black hole out of the other yeah, part. So the memory is the other end of the wormhole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I mean, I don't, so I guess the, the only reason to slow down is that you're going to have high accelerations potentially well, on this part. I mean, I guess in, in kind of the Unruin World paper, they claim that they can do this without. Um, you know, there's no impediment to how fast you can mine the black hole or do the opposite process. Now, I, I think the only issue is that you're, you know, each time you, if you have to, that's right. So now each time you do it, if you're going to do it over many, and I, you know, you you need to do perfect reverse mining yes. here. The atom is just concerned with getting some energy out. Yes, possibly. Well, I see the thing is I don't, you know, the thing is that you don't I don't mind if a lot of it escapes. In other words, I you could be happy with a, a, a 10, you know, a 10 entropy 10 black hole. Um, because there's no distinction between the stuff that's inside the black hole and this stuff that's escaped. I don't have access to it. I never need to act on it. So in that sense, it's a very different thing in the sense that you're, um, you know, there you want to preserve the radiation so that you can act on it. But here, you're never going to act on the stuff that kind of escapes. You're only acting on the memory. Right? So, I mean, you can think of it like you've let the, the black hole evaporate well past its page time. You don't care about those early photons that escaped. You just care about the few that are coming out. But you, you have to build you have to build this thing adiabatically isentropically. Isentropically. It doesn't. I'm, unless unless there's something special, usually you would say that to build something isentropically, you have to do it slower than the inverse level spacing between the levels of the system. Uh, that, that not always the case, but uh, doesn't that mean an exponentially long time? I'm not so sure because I don't know that there's a. I mean, in other words, I'm, I'm not sure that there's any limit to how much entropy you can dump in in each, in each cycle. But like I said, sorry, I'll end it. Like I said, the thing is that you don't need to trap all this, all this stuff there. I'm happy if, I don't mind if almost all of it gets out. I think actually in chaotic systems, they might be more robust than you think. I, I, I yeah, no, I think they're actually less connected. And there's something one can work out from, from the ETH. We could, yeah. So I definitely agree that you know this leads to questions about creating in, in, in entangled black holes and how easy it is. Um, 
but I don't at the moment see kind of a physical, like uh, some, fun, I would, you know, some fundamental law which tells you you can't do that. Okay. So maybe let me just briefly. Um, what, how, what? Okay, so I'll just be very brief, and I won't talk about um, fundamental structure of information. But I'm generally interested in, um, you know, I, I don't take it as sacrosanct that quantum theory has to, will remain um, unchanged in any quantum theory of gravity or anything that resolves the information problem. And so I think it's worthwhile to consider alternatives and generalizations of quantum theory. And so um, I did some joint work with Marcus Mueller and Oscar Dalston on this. Um, I also you know, think that so where we're modifying the state space and seeing that information behaves very differently, and um, also interested in modifying the evolution law so that you get fundamental destruction of information. I think these things are worthwhile just to explore and see what kind of happens and changes, without even taking a kind of a definite position on these things. Um, so all I'll say is maybe if people want to read that, I won't talk about the fundamental destruction of information problem, which kind of attempts to get around the, uh, co the problem of conservation laws, I'll just say maybe I've, got a, you know, I've never submitted version two of this paper because I didn't think anyone was interested in it. Um, but maybe, maybe people will get, if people are interested, I can send them the version two, just please. Let me know. All right. So um, we're interested in using black holes as some kind of lens to understand the quantum theory of gravity and see it, you know, what happens when we modify quantum mechanics. And I think if we take the fact that black holes are lens seriously, then you know, exploring various modifications to quantum mechanics and seeing what happens is a really good way to test out our theories, whether we can reproduce the, um, uh, the black hole entropy or whether we can kind of get around the navigate through the information problem. So um, let me just say that there are some generalizations of quantum theory or proposed generalizations of quantum theory which allow us to evade AMPs through something called information hiding. And black holes, um, and in quantum theory, black holes, you cannot hide information in black holes. Uh, I'll say what, what, that, what that means. Um, and so let me just say, OK, so, so information, um, information in quantum theory, if, if, so let's assume unitary evolution again. Information in quantum theory behaves in a very probably particular way. Um, if you look at the entropy outside the black hole, if you create the black hole from a pure state and look at the entropy outside the black hole, it goes up, and then at some point, information escapes. And what I want to show is that in generalizations of quantum theory, that picture can change a lot. In other words, the picture of when information, the page time, when information starts to escape, that can change a lot in these generalizations of quantum theory. OK, so that's one thing that can change. Um, And as before, I think what we've, what we've, you know, when I talk about information, I will always have a reference system, C. So I imagine, I'm always going to imagine that I'm talking about information which is correlated with some reference system, C, and is inside the black hole. And I'm interested in how long it takes to get out. And we know from quantum information theory that how long it takes to get out not only depends on the theory, but can also depend on the kind of information we're talking about. So for example, we were able to show in 2005 that classical information can get out, can, can stay in the, you know, if, if the dynamics are efficiently scrambling, then classical information will only come out at the very end. But we know from Hayden and Preskill that if we have a maximally entangled black hole, information will come out almost instantly. Um, and something that's very particular to quantum theory is that you cannot hide information in a quantum system. So what do I mean by that? I've kind of already said it twice, um, but I'll maybe say it one more time. And it's basically the fact that um, if you decouple, so let's say you have a message inside a black hole entangled with a reference system C, then if, you, if the information leaves the black hole, all right, if information leaves the black hole, in other words, it's no longer coupled it's completely decoupled from the reference system C. So if the, inf if, if the black hole forgets the information that was inside it, so you decouple the black hole from C. Okay, so here we have inside the black hole, and C is in a product state. You've seen this twice already. Um, then all the information must be outside the black hole. Okay, so there's no hiding. You can't hide information 
in quantum theory. And that's a remarkable and, and particular to quantum theory. This is not true classically. Okay? You, can have you can hide information in correlations classically. But in quantum mechanics, um, you cannot do that. And in fact, there's people that have axiomatized quantum theory where one of the axioms is just exactly this, that purifications are unique up to a unitary. So this is a very strong feature of quantum theory. And what I want to um, show you, I think the key message in these, about these generalizations of quantum theory is that, in, that this is very particular to quantum mechanics. And in most generalizations of quantum theory, and in classical mechanics as well, um, this is not, this, you can hide information. And really, the, the whole information problem, the kind of the, uh, you know, if you believe in unitarity, the kind of the, what is getting you into so much trouble is this fact that you can't hide information. Well, just exactly this thing that if I'm product, if the inside is product with C, then if I purify it, I'm going to purify it on, the only thing to purify it on is outside the system. An entangled, so once I'm completely decoupled, you can of course be, you know, partially correlated with C and partially correlated with something else, but you can't be decoupled from C and not have the information be completely outside of a black hole. The only alternative would be there was hidden correlations. Right, and you know, um, and classically you can hide information in, chlor in, in correlations, but quantumly you cannot. Okay. And so, in the context of, um, in the context of information theory, this was just state merging and decoupling, and it's actually Bronstein and Patty that applied this to um, black holes and called it the no-hiding theorem. I, th I suspect that's not a very well-known paper, but it's it's a nice one. Um, yeah, the, the kind of the in quantum information around 2005 and in um, 2007. Okay, so I, I don't really have enough time to to kind of go over these theories in, in any detail, but um, there is no theory. Is the, I guess what the first thing I'd like to say. There's just um, some kind of generalizations of quantum theory and some some hope that they're consistent and give you a theory. But there's there's some examples of these kinds of theories, um, toy, I would say toy examples, where you, things that people have heard of, popescu Rorlich boxes and things like that. Um, so there's, there's, there's examples of these theories. And there, there, there are a few examples, but there's not really a full theory with dynamics or anything close to that. So I, this is just kind of a teaser that I think these things are worth studying and understanding better. Um, so I'm going to f assume a few, th I'm going to consider uh, generalizations of quantum theory which have the following properties. Um, and the properties that you kind of need to demand if you want to um, understand, if you want to kind of use them in the black hole information problem. Because these, fa these four assumptions are effectively ne you know, necessary if you want to say anything non-trivial about, about black hole information problem using these theories. So for example, transitivity, meaning that we can it's, it's kind of like unitarity. It's like no information loss. That we can effectively have a reversible transformation, which takes, um, which, I, where, which takes any state to, to a standard state. Right? So that's just the equivalent of unitarity in these series, saying that there's reversible dynamics, no information loss. I'm going to assume that. I guess it would be the equivalent by saying, it's, so the, the equivalent is saying that I can, there exists a unitary which will take me from the all zero state to any other state. That would be the equivalent statement in quantum theory. That I can create any state from a unitary acting on a standard state. So the equivalent is just that I have a reversible transformation which can create any well, state. I'm trying to understand in what sense it might mean something a little bit different than that as a general theory. Right. Well, unitary has a other properties that I'm just, you know, this will be a, I'm just. Is a, a linear transformation acting on a vector space, so we're not assuming that? We're not assuming that, but we will show that, I mean, it's, it's, it's a case that if it's, li we will assume linearity. You can always take any two things and invent the transformation, which takes one to the other. But, uh, well, it may not be, re you need a reversible transformation, so. From the same transformation. Sorry. Uh, omega is is you can represent it as a vector. You can almost represent anything you want as a vector, but it's not going to necessarily be a density matrix. So a density matrix would be a particular example. 
So we're going to assume that classical states are contained within our state space. And now we're going to, um, two numbers will become important for understanding how information flows in these systems. One is going to be called K. This is, this is um, you know, this is kind of due to Hardy, this way of axiomatizing these generalizations of quantum theory. But K is the number of parameters we need to describe our system, right? And I'm going to assume that there's no kind of collective degrees of freedom, because this would be another way to easily get out of the black hole information problem. In other words, if I take two systems and I move them to, you know, if I have one system and another system, there's not going to suddenly appear magically extra degrees of freedom. So the number of degrees of, the number of parameters needed to describe my system is just going to be less, less than or equal to the number of parameters I need to describe A and the number of parameters I need to describe B. All right. And then I assume convexity of my state space, meaning that if I, I, that I can flip coins and create, you know, if I can prepare states omega 1 and omega 2, then I can also flip a coin and prepare one of them with probability P and the other one with probability 1 minus P. That's kind of a standard assumption in all these theories. And now we're going to call n the number of states we can distinguish with a single measurement. All right. So I'll maybe just mention a few of the examples so you get some intuition. So a qubit is 1, fits within this set of generalizations. So k, I, and here I'm, k is going to ignore, is it going to include the normalization factor? All right. So for example, for a qubit, k is 4, because I can describe it just by, well, we have you know, the, 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 here's the normalization, and then we have four, the density matrix has some, you know, three other parameters. Okay. So K is four, um, but I can only ever distinguish two possible states. So I can either distinguish, say, zero and one, or plus and minus, but I can't um, distinguish both. And so quantum theory, in general, has the property that K is equal to N squared. All right, the number of parameters I need to describe my system is um, n squared, where n is the number of um, orthogonal states that I can distinguish. Now, the classical bit, um, you don't have this freedom, of course, of choosing a basis. So, you know, there's only um, two possible states. So, k is, k is two because of this normalization. The number of states I can distinguish is either just zero or one, and so k equals n. So, classical theory is described by, is, is equivalent to k equals n and quantum theory by k equals n squared. Probably the most um, famous example, at least in, in foundation, people that study foundations of quantum theory, probably one of the best examples of these theories is something called a, a popescu rorlich box. It's famous because it violates the CHS H inequality. It can violate a Bell inequality much uh, with you know, greater strength than quantum theory. Um, and so we can represent the state, say, space by a kind of a cube, what we have here is that um, like quantum theory, you have two different kinds of measurements you can perform. So you can either try and distinguish um, these two states from these two states, or you can try and distinguish these two states by these two states. So we have four possible states. Um, so like quantum theory, it has kind of this notion of a basis, um, but it doesn't really have an uncertainty principle in some sense. Um, so the number of distinguishable states you can distinguish is two. You can distinguish W2 from W3, um, but the number of parameters you need is three. All right? So that's another example of such a theory. And these are these, this is actually a very powerful theory in the sense that you can you can saturate the CHSH inequality. Okay. So here's the setup, which by now you're probably all familiar with. Um, we have a reference system. We have a message which is inside our black hole, H0, and we may or may not have some Hawking evaporation. This is real Hawking evaporation, not that fake, horrible memory kind that I talked about earlier. Um, and now what we're interested in, we remove a system B, and, and, and that kind of comes out of the black hole, and we're going to require that it looks quantum, okay? We don't, at low energy, we want this thing to look quantum. We don't want it to be some, um, crazy looking theory. Um, and now we're interested in how quickly does information get out. And the technical result is a decoupling theorem for these generalized um, theories. Um, I'm not going to um, 
go through proving it or even maybe say that much about it, except that um, it depends crucially on, on the number of possible states you can distinguish and the number of um, parameters you need to describe the theory. And the more parameters that are needed to describe your state space, the easier it is to decouple in this theory. Right. So um, we have a generalized decoupling theorem. We can recover the original result of Hayden and Preskill. Um, and it's kind of cute. I always wondered why there was a one half, you know, why the number of qubits you need to send out of a black hole, say, is one half the mutual information. Where does this one half factor come? It actually comes um, about because of this R, the, the fact that k is equal to n squared. So it's, that's kind of, in some sense, where the, the, uh, this one half factor comes about. It's in some sense because entanglement is like in two bases, you can think of it like that. Um, there's kind of, an, and that's, it's about how many parameters there are for an, for an entangled bit. So, so we recover the original, so this is, this is the general result for all R, and for R equals two, we recover the hayden preskill result that we just need to send slightly more qubits than the size of the reference system. Um, but if you look at this, if you look at this formula, so, so this is the number, nb is the number of qubits that you need to send out. nm was the number of qubits in our memory. And if you send out you know, a large number of qubits, then um, you will decouple, and, and you will, you'll decouple the inside of the black hole from the memory. But notice that as r gets larger, it's kind of strange because um, in, R is one for classical. R is one for classical. R is two for quantum. So you can get a faster Sorry. Classical. That's right. Half. It's half the, half the mutual information. In some sense. Um, and what's really strange is that as R gets larger, information comes out quicker and qu appears. Well, I shouldn't say comes out quicker. It leaves the black hole because of the decoupling theorem. It leaves the black hole faster and faster. And what's amazing is that. It actually, you can, it leaves the black hole before even the size of the message comes out. So I can have a hugely large message, throw out, if I have scrambling, and then I throw out a few particles, and the message has left the black hole, even though the message was large. So that's very surprising and kind of puzzling. So what's going on? How is that possible? Um, it's possible um, because you have this thing of hiding. So in quantum theory, if the radiation gets decoupled from, uh, what I want to say, yeah. If so, initially the radiation is decoupled from Charlie, so there's no information outside the black hole. You emit a bunch of um, uh, qubits or photons, and then finally the black hole is decoupled from Charlie, and at that point all the information is outside, um, and and with the reference system. Here. What's happening is that there's a whole region where information is hidden. So initially, the radiation is decoupled from Charlie. Some Hawking photons are emitted. Um, but then, but even, the, you know, um, and then, sorry, what do I want to say? Um, oh, yeah, sorry, here, sorry. There's no, inf so you, you emit a few um, photons. There's no information inside the black hole. But still, even though you completely decoupled the black hole from the reference system, you don't, the information does not exist outside the black hole. And only towards the end does the information appear outside the black hole. So um, in these generalizations of quantum theory, you can kind of have it that the information leaves the black hole very quickly, but doesn't appear outside the black hole till the very end of the evaporation. Can you say that it's stored in correlations? It's in some sense stored in correlations. Because K is so large, uh, so many parameters. That's right. So what's happening in some sense is a very small system can purify a huge, a very large system because k is so large. But n is very small; it can be very small. So it's not going to violate a Beckins, It's not going to violate an entropy bound, even though you have a very small system. Um, and the reason is that entropy bounds ought to, ought to is about n, not k, right? Because Jacobs' kind of argument for argument for entropy bounds was a thermodynamic argument. And if you remember the von Neumann argument about why you know, the number of orthogonal states in quantum theory should, why his entropy was a thermodynamic entropy, it had exactly to do with these boxes which had filters which measured quantum states. Okay? So likewise here, we expect the number of distinguishable states to represent the thermodynamic entropy. And therefore, if you believe in entropy bounds, and not everyone does, but if you believe in entropy bounds, then it's going to be n. It's going to be the number of 
distinguishable states which refer to entropy bounds. So here, you can do things that without violating an entropy bound that you wouldn't be able to do in quantum theory. Okay, so let me just summarize and, and call it a day. Um, so there are generalizations of quantum theory, or and, and again, we don't know much about these things, which have different relations between the number of d distinguishable states and the number of parameters you need to describe the theory. Information flows very differently in these systems. So you can have small systems which purify larger ones and still respect entropy bounds. And you have this kind of apparent contradiction that information leaves the black hole faster but takes longer time to arrive outside the black hole horizon. Um, and, so, um, and, 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 and so you have this kind of violation of the no hiding theorem in some sense. And a question I guess that I have is, can these generalized theories have polyamorous entanglement? Now, I, the reason I gave that, that signaling experiment is because these are non-signaling theories. Um, so in that sense, they cannot have polyamorous entanglement. But the AMPS argument, it doesn't appear to me, at least on, this, on the surface of it, it, it's not clear what you mean by um, non-monogamy of entanglement, in the sense that you may have non-monogamy of entanglement in the sense that two things you know, any two systems look like they're EPR pairs, but it's not clear that you need, that you can perform all these different kinds of measurements which would allow you to violate no signal. So that's a question which I think may be interesting to pursue. And on that note, thanks very much.